OK. So some additional ingredients. I talk about an internal variable and about, you know, that according to the general theory, whenever, whenever I define an internal variable, I have to talk about an evolution equation. OK? OK, so the evolution equation is that r dot is going to be a function of lambda, and I impose that this lambda is always greater than 0. We'll see why. OK? And I also define, this defines the evolution of r. But what is the initial value? The initial value, which is r for the virgin material, we said that for the virgin material, talking about one material, elastic material, we said we, we know that every material has, every virgin material has a threshold at which it loses elasticity, right? This is called the yelter stress or the elastic stress or whatever. So that's something like that. For the virgin material, before any damage, the R takes a certain value, which is, that is a material property. The value of R for the virgin material. But then it can evolve. So it's no longer a material property after damaging, OK? And that can damage from this R0, the damage can increase to infinity. So they plot R, R, initially for the virgin material, starts here, R0, which is a positive value. And then it's always positive, and it can increase up to the infinity, OK? Then I define the damage law. The damage law is that that define d as 1 minus q over r. That's the definition of d. d was an intermediate variable, the damage variable. That was the internal variable. So I define d as 1 minus q over r. And this, of course, this d has to be in the range 0, 1, which places some limitations on q. q has to be such that the ranges of q keep the d in this, in this damage. OK? This is the ranges of q. q is a variable that is called that is called the da the damage law and q it's called the hardening law this variable controls the hardening of the material i will introduce later on what we understand by hardening or softening <coughs> a material hardens when beyond elasticity when inelasticity starts it still has some strength but, and this strength increases. We said the material hardens. That's a concept. Mm -hmm. In general, imagine that I take a, a, a piece of, maybe you are not able to deform a, a chew, chewing gum, for instance. You are able to take a piece of chewing gum, OK? Very soon that you, that you try to pull it, at the beginning you see that the material hardens. So, I mean, you notice that elasticity is lost. So the material starts flowing, so to speak. But still, you need to do an increasing, at the beginning, an increasing force to deform it. And beyond a certain point, your hands flow. That is, the material has su suffered something that was first hardening and then softening. OK? Hardening is the capacity of the material. Many materials have that. All materials, before breaking, have first hardening and then softening. OK? That's the physical reality. So what controls that? That is the hardening variable, and the relation of this hardening with the internal variable is called the hardening law. That is very important. That is a material property, too. That, that equation, that relationship is a material property. Look, R is the internal variable. We said that it starts at a certain threshold, R0, and goes this way. And Q is a scalar function of that, which starts at the same value, R0, and then increases too, but it can decrease too. If increases, then denotes hardening. If that law decreases, we are modeling softening. So that is some variable that we just take of our pocket that in such a way that if uh, the evolution of this variable <coughs> with in terms of the internal variable is such that the derivative of Q with respect to R is positive, we have hardening. As soon as this derivative is negative, we have softening. OK? And that's our, one of our ways of modeling material. If we model, we take this curve for our material as having a positive variable, even constant, for instance, 
all the time long, then we model a material that softens, that hardens, sorry. If, the, if that is, the, is, is negative, up to certain things, because this, this material cannot be negative, it softens, for instance, that way, then the material softens. That's the way that we have that. We'll see why. I'm just stating it, but we'll see why. But that's the variable in charge of that. And by the way, the slope of this curve, the derivative of Q which get to R, is something that plays also a fundamental role in this kind of dissipative materials, is called the hardening modulus. So the hardening modulus is the slope at every point of the hardening law. For instance, in this curve here where the material hardens, because Q always have a positive derivative, how is the hardening modulus? Can you say? Pardon me? Tangent. Yes, tangent, but how is it? Positive or negative? Positive. So a positive value of the hardening modulus indicates that the material hardens. A negative value of the hardening modulus meet, means that the material softens. OK? Yeah. Could you just sketch uh, Q with, uh, with the stress? Not directly. Yeah, indirectly, yes, but not directly. In fact, in the model, look, this, the model is a cert, certain ingredients fulfilling the rules. But I mean, they are not directly connected everyone with each other, but indirectly. Of course, Q depends on R, which depends on the strains, which depends on the stresses. But not, I cannot, in, of course, sometimes it's possible for simple cases, it can be shown. In fact, for 1D cases, Q is just the stress. Is the, is the max, Q is the, exactly, is the stress. So Q somehow, look, look at that, we'll talk that. Q is the norm of the stress. We'll see. For the material that it's completely damaging, look, you, you can, I mean, the, the question can be useful for that. A material that is all the time long damaging in an elastic state, all the time long, this is zero. So what is the norm of the stresses? Q. What is measuring Q? The, somehow the magnitude of the stresses in a scalar, in a norm. So the answer to your question, sorry, the answer to the question is what is Q? Q in a, con in a point that is continuously damaging, that is continuously inelastic, is nothing else than the norm of the stresses at this point. Okay? But this is only for a material, for a point that is continuously damaging. If the point unloads, then maybe it's not. Okay? So that is the... the and then what is R? Well, R, yeah, that's what I said. What happens in R? R, according to that, when that is equal to zero, a material which is continuously damaging all along the process of the formation, tau epsilon is equal to R. So R is a measure of the stresses, of the strains. That's it. So there is a relation of Q and R. Well, that is a material property. That H or that law, but that law is characterized by H. If I know H, I know the law. Okay? So that H is what characterizes is a material property. The hardening of the modulus is normally a material property of the of the material. A property of the material. So uh, maybe you can finish here. Let me see. Okay, I think uh, maybe it's a good point to stop here. I think so. I think we are going to stop here, make a break, and then in 15 minutes we'll go back. Okay. So let's continue with the subject that we are dealing with and say something about the hardening law. That law that relates the hardening variable with the internal variable. We know that starts at the point R0, R0, R0 being something we can we'll finally translate that into values, but it's a, it's a material property, R0, and then evolves, okay? The point is that, is that this evolution free? We can impose this evolution at our wish. Then the question is that we have some limitations. For instance, we have the D dot is, is greater than zero. The damage variable cannot decrease. So just, and we have also the definition of D in terms of Q is that one. 
Okay? So just by differentiation, we obtain that, t d is this, and then r dot is greater than zero, r dot is greater than zero by construction. So finally we have that in order that this is fulfilled, this numerator here has to be greater than zero, which means that this is greater than this. And that means that this, the h, which is, I recall, the slope or the hardening law, hardening, softening law, the slope at every point, has to be at every point uh, smaller than q over r. q over r is the slope of the second value, the one that passes through q divided by r, which is the slope here. So if I, at every point I just trace this slope, I couldn't have here, for instance, a revolution like that, right? With a slope larger than this magnitude at this point. This is a quite, I mean, it's not very restrictive. Just to tell you that we have to be consistent and sometimes if you invent some evolution which is just compatible with that, we can have some unusual and unexpected values. And it's not the, it's not the fault of the constitutive model. It's our fault in inserting the properties of this constitutive model. Okay? Well, uh, look, I said that there is a relationship of the elastic domains in the stress space and in the strain space in the sense that if a point, the stress of a point lies in the elastic domain in the stress space, it also li lies in the, into the elastic domain in the strain space. Okay? But then there are some differences in that. For instance, uh, Imagine that we know that R dot, the evolution of the damage variable, we have imposed always being greater than zero. We'll see why. Okay? So R dot always increasing than zero, what does it mean? It means that since this surface is tau epsilon equal R, as R dot, in, as R increases, the size of this ellipsoid increases too. Okay? So this ellipsoid in the strain space, the elastic domain always increases. You agree with me? Why? Because R dot is always increasing, so R is always increasing. So that means that at a certain stage, tau epsilon is equal to R. What hap happens in a subsequent stage? This R is the same or larger. And that means it's like the radius, in that case, the radius of, the, of this circle, which is not a circle, because the matrix is not the unity, but the, the size increases. Okay? That in the strain space. What about the stress space? That's not the same. Q can increase or decrease, depending if we have hardened or softening. So that means that that size, that size, that, that, that volume, can span or can contract and shrink. Okay? So that's the difference. Sur surprising. Also, we can always say that you, if a point is inside at a, a certain time, if the point is inside the elastic domain in the strain space, it's also inside in the, st in the uh, elastic domain in the stress space. Okay? Well, so once we have this in that, by the way, this is what is expressed here, that, 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 that this can just expand, and this can expand and contract depending on, on if we have, that's what we have here, no? Here, for hardening, we have expansion. For softening, in the stress space, we have contraction. Okay? So, in the stress space, not in the strain space, where we have also expansion. So, there is one point to be solved, which is the so-called how to state that evolution equation. The judge said, well, R dot is a lambda, but how, what is lambda? How do we solve lambda? I didn't say yet. Okay? So we're going to that point. And that is not going to be defined as uh, in, a, in, in a very easy way, in a very straightforward way, or in a very direct way, but in a quite indirect way which is what I'm going, the point I'm going to now, is the famous, very famous, karush tucker conditions. Are any of you familiar with these conditions? Have you met these conditions? Okay. 
These are very, very common in optimization. In optimization, are conditions to met a minimum of one function in a domain which is restricted by inequality conditions. Inequality, inequality conditions. Okay. So the way that these conditions, by the way, this was what made the, you know this famous Nash that was given the Nobel Prize that that. Uh, that was uh, uh, made famous in a movie that was John Nash. So this guy was the one that contributed in the theory of games to this, uh, using these conditions. Anyway, so close the parenthesis to say, how did we take that, this? It's not clear, I'm not going to tell you, but there is a way of connecting these models with optimization, okay? And that's, just one. And that's why these conditions look like the same conditions that we that are used in optimization processes. We'll see something of that in plasticity when we talk about minimal dissipation. In plasticity, we will talk about minimal dissipation or maximum dissipation. And then talking about maximum or minimum means that we are optimizing something. And since we are optimizing something, then this brings the computer conditions. Okay. But anyway, we will not resort to continuous conditions to make it to the current continuous conditions. And first, I will try to explain what is that. First, in a geometrical point of view, and then in a mathematical point of view. Okay, in order to make more, uh, that make your your uh, make you familiar uh, to that in an easier way. Okay. So, imagine that we have a history of a stress strain. So the stress, according to the loading that I imposed at every point, we have a history of the stresses and a history of the strains. In a certain time, you have a certain stress, stress field, stresses, six, that's a second order tensor, certain strains. At a, sub at a subsequent time, t plus delta t, we have sigma t plus delta t, epsilon t plus delta t. D later on, we have sigma t, etc. So we have a history of the stresses and a history of the strain. What does it mean? That of course, the stresses in the in the in the stress space, we are following certain paths. I initially, initially for a virgin material, we have zero stress, zero strain. So our the history starts always at the origin of this domain, and then we have we are moving inside this domain. We are moving inside this domain in a certain way, depending on the the, the, the motion here depends on what is the history of external loads that we apply to our structure so that at the point that we are considering experiences a certain history. Okay? Well, so what we want to impose now is that while the point, well, I, I will tell you something. The initial, the initial uh, elastic domains is not zero. Since the initial values for Q and R are not zero, are, are zero, remember, are zero. So that means that there is an initial elastic domain both in the stress and the strain spaces. Okay? I anticipate that while we are in the interior of this initial elastic domain for the virgin material, then the behavior will be elastic. Okay? So now it makes sense talking about elastic domain. The elastic domain <coughs> at every time shows the locus of points where if the stress state lies inside, the behavior is elastic. What does the elastic mean? We'll go to that. But I mean that damage is not increased, in other words. There is no creation of damage. Okay? By the way, for the bridging material, we start at the beginning, either at the origin, even at the stress, and the strain uh, spaces, and then we, we move. And until we do not touch the surface, the, the, the initial elastic uh, damage surface, so nothing happens. The material is elastic. Okay? And this also sets some limits for the elastic behavior of the material. What happens when the material touches the surface? Or even more, tries to escape from the elastic domain. That's what the answer we want to say. So we are considering the life after elasticity. Okay? For many years, engineers thought that after elasticity there was no life, that the structure 
broke down after Rusticity's last. And that's not that's what the modern constitutive theory tried to overcome, this concept. Okay. So the way that we are going to synthesize that is that well well the points remain in the elastic domain. The behavior is elastic in the sense that the internal variable doesn't change. Okay? R dot is equal to zero. If there is no evolution of R, there is no evolution of Q. Okay? Look at that. If there is no evolution of R, there is no evolution of Q. Okay? There is the relation of that. If R is fixed, Q doesn't change. Okay? If R is fixed and Q is Q, is, is fixed, then look that D, the damage value, is also fixed. So nothing evolves. That is the meaning of elastic. There is no evolution of the internal variables, nor any associated variable. Typically, the hardening variable and the damage variable. OK? Well, so uh, that is what while we are here. So, so far, so good. Second, what happens when, in the history of loading, one point reaches the current elastic domain? I say current because it's the elastic domain.